determine what future you want, you can then work on getting that. And so we've done that, um, and I'll go through an example in which we've done that, but scenario planning has been used quite a bit. It was first invented by Shell Oil um, to kind of deal with the upcoming oil prices that happened in the 70s, 80s, etc. Um, but it's been used quite a bit since then. And so here are just a few examples of where it has been used. Um, one of the most famous ones is the South African, right here, South African hot chloride process, where when they were, um, when apartheid was ending, they were doing this big transition, and they were having a hard time with two sides coming together and discussing. And so they set up um, a scenario planning process where they took and basically sat down and came up with these four scenarios. So Flight of the Flamingos was the one they ended up with, where both governments work together and everybody goes up together. Um, the ostrich, for example, was when the white government stuck their hand, head in the sand and just kind of put their hands up and left it be. And these two um, were some variations of that. Um, but you can see that I have put these in four columns because often um, there are four scenarios that are put together. Um, they're usually put, and I'll show you in a second, on an axis. And usually they have some, sort of certain um, aspects and characteristics. So we did one where we use, we use a lot of the information dumped in the Great Transition. So the Great Transition, what it did, it's a multi-decadal project that has been going on building these global scenarios. Um, these scenarios are arch type scenarios, so they have similar characteristics. And what we did was we looked at, usually you have a grid. On the grid, on one axis, is something that you cannot control. So global GDP, or focus on GDP versus focus on well-being. Globally, globally, it's hard to control. Versus on the other axis, something you can control a little bit more. So in your community, are you focused on individualism or are you focused on community? And you create the four scenarios around that. So you'll notice these four correspond to what Great Transition is. So Great Transition um, has been working with scientists for a few decades now trying to put these together. So we use these to look at ecosystem services going into the future. And so we created, we pulled out some characteristics. Some of this stuff came from great transition, some from um, other scenarios. And we basically put together, so great transition, let me explain this a bit. Great transition is where um, there's a community sense of being, um, well-being is high in that community, where things are shared, things are co-owned. On the other side, um, you have things like Fortune's World, where individualism is high, but there's a focus on well-being. But because individualism is high, everybody kind of goes on their own. Uh, everybody tries to make this, you know, it's my well-being that's important, not the communities. Um, on the other hand, you have policy reform, where there is this focus on GDP growth, and yet there is a community that's being built. So there's a need for planning, but the focus is always growth. Versus market forces, where everybody's out on their own and there is this focus on GDP. So how do I make more money? So looking at those four, um, we were able to define, right, this is out to 2050 scenarios. We were able to sort of define the population in each of these scenarios global GDP, inequality, and then um, different land uses, so urban, cropland, forest, um, rangeland, desert, etc. So we built a model that looked at basically these six land uses. Um, it was a GIS, GIS model where it took urban, for example, defined the extent of urban, and then it defined the extent of wetland and so on down the list. Once urban was defined, it could not be changed from there. So we created a GIS model and got this. I understand, again, really small. Let me, I'll just go quickly through it to get you the idea. 
So it was the same idea where the area and the unit values were the ones that matter. So in each of these, the area of the ecosystem service, ecosystem extent change based on the scenario. So you'll see in the red ones is where it decreased, the green ones is where it increased. We also change the unit value because in different scenarios, those ecosystem services would be valued more or less. And we found that in the great transition scenario, we could get up to a $152 trillion increase by 2050, or if we went with, what was this one? With um, market forces, we could have up to an $87 um, trillion decrease. So it's quite significant difference. And a lot of that is based on the policy that we choose to implement globally and nationally um, in the future. So this shows basically a graph of the annual ecosystem service value depending on the four scenarios. So these are the four scenarios and you'll see similar numbers. So this is about a, this is a great transition one, market forces. We also did a sensitivity analysis looking at what would happen if you change the area, but not the unit values. And we found that the trend would be exactly the same. Uh, it'd just be a lower magnitude of change. So, so solid, the solid lines are using changing unit values for each scenario. Dashed lines are using 2011 unit values. And so here is a map. So this is the baseline we started. And I'll go through the four scenarios. The best way to look at this map, because keep in mind, this is global model, so the changes are huge. It's looking at places we found that change the most are ones that were around desert. Because around deserts, you have more, um, you are more likely to get a lot more desertification um, if you went towards the market forces scenario, but you had a lot of opportunity to rebuild the land if you had towards great transition. So if you look at this area for Australia, in certain areas where you already see desert, you'll see the big differences. So we also look at um, the percent change of ecosystem service value for each country, for each scenario. So you see that with Brazil, um, although it does change, so red is decreased in value, green is increased, the darker green, the higher the increase, the darker the red, the higher the decrease. And you find that Brazil, although it does decrease and increase in the various scenarios, um, it's not as strong as some of the other countries where they do have more, um, as I said, desert. I got this in not pretty extreme, but if you get the PowerPoints, the, these are all the countries and the numbers for the four Latin America. So we were able to take the global map and divide it up into individual countries. But um, if you pull out Brazil, so you'll find this is land cover. This is land cover for Brazil in 2011 and the four scenarios. This is the where the changes happen. So everywhere you see black, is where the um, the land use change and the value change. And here is the value change, um, red and green, depending whether it's positive or negative. As a comparison, China, you can see the same same thing. Land cover, where they cover changes, and what the changes are, whether they're positive or negative. The US, same, same idea, much growth. And so we can pull these out for any country or any region in the world and work with those countries. Okay, so Brazil. Um, Brazil, I pulled out some data. So this, these up here are the 2011 valleys for Brazil. So we, Brazil is about 8 million kilometers squared, uh, about 6.3% of the world population. GDP is about, um, oh this is a million, sorry, I forgot that. Um, 
But then you see that it's about $6 trillion per year, which is 9.4% of the world ecosystem service value, and about seven, almost $8,000 per hectare per year. This is just for Brazil. Now, if you look at the four different scenarios, you find that with market forces, you have a decrease of about 30%. Which is goes down to about four and a half trillion. With Fortress World, forty-five percent decrease, and you can see the per hectare values as well right here. Policy reform stays about the same, and great transition is about twenty-five percent increase. Okay, so what does this all mean? So you've seen a version of this slide before, and this shows the tipping points, basically. So Amazon rainforest, if that disappeared, that could be one big tipping point. But there are a lot of other ones around the world. So for example, if the uh, Indian, Indian monsoon summers go away, or the ocean meth, methane hydrate right here. So there are these tipping points that if something happens to them, the climate of will, will change. And a lot of those are based on um, precipitation. So you look at, this is the average change of precipitation between 1901 and 2010, and this is 1951 and 2010. If you look at the difference, again, the darkest areas are around where the deserts usually are. And that's where it's changed, but if you look at Brazil, there's significant change as well. Um, in the last 60 years versus the first 50 years of the 19th century. And you see a version of this as well earlier, um, planetary boundaries, and we are exceeding some of these planetary boundaries. So for example, biodiversity, we've exceeded. Um, and yet there's others that we just don't know quite what's happening. So. Um, aerosol loading right here. We're not sure where that boundary um, is or what's happening to it. And certain ones like land system change, which we talked about, is sort of in the uncertainty zone. We don't quite know where that tipping point is, and we don't know how far, much further we have to go. We just know that we're somewhere in that area. There are many ways to use um, valuations, um, and you saw a version of this as well. Basically, um, a lot of it is to raise awareness, saying, you know, there is a value to these things. If you don't value it in any way, you assume the value is zero, which is completely incorrect. So how do we make sure to incorporate these values into the decisions we make? And unfortunately, the way our society currently works is we need to get those into modern values. So how do you put up international accounts? How do you make sure that the ecosystem services um, are calculated when making that decision whether to put in a development into a forest area? Um, national income well-being account. So this, a lot of this is happening. Um, the UN, for example, has produced these accounts, the sum of accounts, um, called the CIA, which the World Bank is now incorporating into many countries. So it's about a dozen countries that are working on incorporating um, ecosystem services directly into national capital. Um, specific policy analysis, like the example I provided for New York, where you are making policies, how to incorporate that. Regional and urban land use planning. So how far do you expand, expand urban growth? How far do you extend it? So Oregon, for example, in the U.S. has an urban growth boundary where they say beyond this point you cannot extend because there's precious ecosystems beyond this point. Um, payment for ecosystem services, there's been some discussion about that. Full cost accounting, making sure ecosystem services are within the price you pay for the goods you buy. So these days, unfortunately, organic products are often more expensive than traditional products. But if you incorporated the full price of those traditional products, you looked at transportation costs and damaged ecosystem services, 
that would change. So how do we get that information back to the consumer? And common asset trust, uh, where the idea is that we own all this together, and so how can we put it into a trust that will allow us to manage it for the global population, for the global good, or regional good, depending on what the asset is. And the SDGs have incorporated some of this. So for example, um, number 15, which looks at life on land, a lot of that has to do with land use, has to do with desertification. Um, and the SDGs were signed off by every country in the world with the idea that, yes, we will try to deal with some of these issues. Um, Bob went into more detail about the, these previously, so I won't go into this. But there's a lot going on, and you've heard about IPDS a little bit earlier, um, which is sort of the IPCC for ecosystem services and biodiversity, and there's a lot going on around that internationally. There's also the ESP, which is the Ecosystem Service Partnership. It's an organization that's trying to bring together academics, um, practitioners, policymakers, business people, all together that are working and dealing with ecosystem services. This is a memo that um, President Obama released last year, basically saying that every agency within the US have to incorporate ecosystem services into their decision making. Um, we recently met with NOAA, the chief economist of NOAA, and she said that they've gotten a better response than expected that pretty much every agency says we want to deal with ecosystem services, we want to incorporate them into our decision making process. So this is actually going to be pretty powerful over the coming years, in the U.S. especially, about how different agencies and institutes deal with ecosystem services. Um, NAD, the National Australian Bank. So businesses are also dealing with ecosystem quite a bit and are incorporating ecosystem services. The National Australian Bank recently announced that it will basically change its interest rate and how it operates based on how ecosystem services are managed on their customers' land. So we're working on a project with them, um, starting with agriculture. So for example, if a farmer is managing their land really well, restoring, being productive, sustainable, their interest rates will be super low. They'll be able to get loans easy. However, if they're degrading their land, overgrazing, um, using too many pesticides, herbicides, their interest rates will be really high. That's a way of the bank sort of protecting itself, mitigating risk, but it's also producing a positive incentive to the farmer saying, you know what, from now on, the way you manage your land will be tied to your financial well-being. So they're changing, they're looking at it differently. And so agriculture is sort of the first way they're doing this, but they're planning on doing this for mining and all the other sectors they can do in. So now, if a mine is, for example, destroying the land around them, that will have very big consequences financially on them of whether they get a loan from a bank. And in Australia, that's a huge issue right now. On the business side, there's also a company called True Cost. Um, what True Cost does is it basically looks at other businesses to determine it looks at other businesses um, to determine what their impact on ecosystem services is. So the first really big one, they've been around for just under 10 years, but the first really big one was a few years ago when they looked at Puma. And Puma approached them saying, do this assessment for us. And they found that when you take ecosystem services into account and how much carbon they made, how much um, value was used up, it was a significant amount per shoe in the case of Puma. They weren't the best company, they weren't the worst company, but at least Puma now has that information and is able to then address different parts of its production line to try to deal with that. Um, is, I believe it's in the USA Today or one of the papers, it 
True Cost also produces um, sort of the sustainability index every year for companies around the world. Um, so it's it's been doing this for quite a while. It, it released this report a few years ago, saying basically that um, there's about three, seven point three trillion dollars of unpriced natural capital being used by corporations around the world, um, which he equals about 13% of our global economic output in 2009. Um, so that's a significant amount. That's basically resources and values that these companies don't have to pay for. They, they have it for free. So the question is, how do we price them? So that's it. Thank you very much.